Good morning or good afternoon everyone depending on where you are joining us from and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Zach Tallis from the Business Review and I will be today's host. I'm delighted to have with us today Tikan who will be discussing advanced drug discovery by improving dose response curve setup. We are joined by Richard C. Marcellus, Jessica Molino, and Ingo Monsenbrook. Richard is a biochemist at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. Ingo is the head of sales development in drug discovery at Tekin, and Jessica is the product manager at Tekin. May I also take this opportunity to remind you that you have the option to submit questions using the questions tool at the top right of your screen, so please do so at any time throughout the presentation. Jessica, Ingo and Richard will then allocate around 10 to 15 minutes to try and answer any questions or thoughts. So without further ado, please may I welcome the first speaker, Jessica. Jessica, if you'd like to click on the screen for me, you now have control. Great, thank you very much. Um, thanks everyone for joining our webinar today. As Zach mentioned, my name is Jessica Merlino and I'm the product manager for HP, for the HPD 300 here at TCAM. Um, we'll have three speakers today. First, myself describing the current dose response curve setup and what our customers say their challenges are, along with what we see as the solution. Next, Dr. Ingo Montenbrook will speak about some of the experimental configurations that can now be easily set up. And finally, we'll have Dr. Richard Marcellus, who will discuss uh, changes in his laboratory created by using this new solution, the HP D300 Digital Dispenser. So let's get started. First, inkjet technology has been reliably used for more than 20 years all around the globe. Hewlett Packard has now repurposed this technology to dispense a titration of small molecules in DMSO. Hewlett Packard and TCAN have partnered together such that HP is the manufacturer of the HP D300 digital dispenser and the cassette, while TCAN is the exclusive sales, marketing, and service channel for the system. Drug titration is a method that's used every day in drug discovery and has seen little improvement over, in time, over time. Currently, serial dilution is used most often to prepare a titration. Our customers have reported to us that there are several major drawbacks to serial dilution, including the amount of time and therefore labor costs that it takes, substantial waste of precious compounds along with plastics and reagents, and further, the process can be complex, requiring expertise. In addition, they've said that there are risks of pipetting error and carryover, Many have found that there is an inflexibility in their process, causing them to have to make a choice between setting up the experiment they desire scientifically or the experiment that is most convenient to set up and run. This includes both the doses that are chosen for the titration, along with more complex experiments, such as drug-drug interaction. The layout of their experiments is driven by their pipetting device, be it a manual pipette or an automation platform, instead of by the scientific requirements. And finally, there are limitations because of personnel or instrumentation availability. Here, we see a traditional titration workflow. The first step is the setup of the experiment, including gathering supplies, calculating the volume of reagents needed or compounds needing to be added. Next, formatting the compounds, which means moving them from whatever starting vessel they're in into the intermediate plate, then adding the diluent to the plate, and finally executing the serial dilution. The plate may also be need to be passed to different departments and potentially sealed and unsealed, maybe mixed, spun down, etc. Some experiments also require an intermediate dilution in media or aqueous base material, and even daughter replicates. Finally, the bioassay is executed uh, with the titration series. In the case of the HPD 300, it's possible to bypass all of these steps and go directly from setting up your experiment using the HPD 300 to dispense the compounds and then executing the bioassay. 
The HPD 300 includes the digital dispenser itself, ready to use T8 cassettes that actually dispense the compound, and a software package that's powerful and easy to use. The T8 cassette is comprised of a print head, which is very similar to the one that's used on your printer at home. The operator only has to load a few microliters of the compound in DMSO to the cassette, and then each dispense head nozzle, there are 22 of those, dispense either 20 picoliter or 13 picoliter droplets directly into a destination plate. Here we can see an example down at the bottom of a potential dose response curve, where at that low end, only 13 picoliters is dispensed, that's one droplet, all the way up to five microliters, which would be many, many droplets, and then you have doses in between. The D300 builds up to the final dose by adding multiples of either 13 picoliter or 20 picoliter droplets, and it does this quickly since it dispenses thousands of droplets per second. The instrument can use any dose in any well of the plate, and it's compatible with 12, 24, 48, 96, and 3D4 well plates. Again, the system is optimized for DMSO with small molecules. The software that controls the HPD300 is simple to learn and enables a variety of plate layouts as shown here, including vertical titrations, horizontal titrations, replicates, randomization, even uh, 2D or combination experiments. The calculations for the volume to add to each well can be done based on the concentration desired within each well. An experiment was performed to compare 30 diverse comp compounds with serial dilution prepared using either manual pipetting, auto pipetting, or an HPD 300. And the findings were equivalent PIC50 values and better reproducibility. Let's take a look at what that data actually looks like. First here, we see a comparison of manual versus HPD 300. This is for 30 different compounds run with an NF3. So on the horizontal axis, we can see the, IC50, the PIC50 values of a manual setup. And on the vertical axis, we can see the PIC50 values of the Hewlett-Packard instrument. Here, the red dotted line shows the ideal one-to-one -one, uh, equivalency between the two methods. And we can see that the actual uh, equivalency between the two methods is the solid black line is just about the same. The same can be said for the second, where we're comparing an auto pipette with the HPD 300. So the auto pipette is on the horizontal axis, and the HP is on the vertical axis. We see virtually a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between the two. Finally, for better reproducibility, we can see here the um, standard deviation being plotted for each of the two methods. On the horizontal axis, we see an autopipetter standard deviation. And on the, on the vertical axis, we see the HPD 300 standard deviation for those same PIC50 values with the same 30 different compounds. For the autopipetter, the standard deviation of those compounds in the PIC50 value is around 1.8 on average, with here shown on the left and right in the lighter red lines, the uh, range of that standard deviation. On the other hand, you can see here that the HPD 300 gives a standard deviation of about around 0.08 with a much smaller uh, range in that standard deviation. Therefore, the HPD 300 in this instance is giving a two-fold improvement. Next, I'd like to turn over the discussion to my colleague, Dr. Ingo Montenbrook, here from TCAM, to discuss more with you the potential experiments that can be carried out using the HPD 300. Yes, hello, and welcome to the second part of the webinar, where we will lead you through some exemplified applications and results showcasing the work with the instrument. Actually, the HPD 300 is not yet another dispenser but rather a new innovative digital titration system and also sort of disruptive technology which has been awarded with several innovation prizes in the drug discovery community. 
already during the first year of its introduction. And why is that so? So it's quite amazing. Once you get started with your small molecule in DMSO titration work, the instrument with its cartridge and dispenser centric design changes the way we think, design, run, and analyze dose response titrations such as IC50 and EC50 determinations. So what makes such difference? First of all, the technology eliminates the need to do any upfront calculations or tedious programming and thereby directs our focus more towards sophisticated research studies, the relevant biology, rather than getting the dilution process itself under control in the most straightforward way. You also have the potential to save on compounds and chemicals and at the same time improve the quality of your data, so to say standard deviation in hill slopes. Last but not least, you can instantly design sophisticated experiments which would otherwise be impractical or very hard to accomplish. So let's move right on to the randomization function. So here you can see in this cartoon you have basically a 96 well microtiter plate where we have applied eight doses in triplicates. These are the reddish wells. And then we have 16 doses in singlicates. These are the blue ones and the yellow ones. And finally, you can see 24 doses in singlicates. So basically, because we are not making any serial dilution, you are free to apply or titrate any dose in any well. And you can use a linear or logarithmic scheme to apply the doses in a horizontal, vertical fashion, mirror, reverse, you name it. But not only that, you can also randomize, and that's what you can see down here, where you have a complete new scheme and the instrument literally randomize all your dosages at least those ones that you have labeled and want to, into that sort of randomization mode. So why is that important? Basically, you could think of a number of experiments where basically randomization would be very important. And this would be in particular assays where you notice edge effects. And that could be, for example, cell-based assays. And this tool gives you now a more unbiased way to analyze cell-based data without having to avoid or eliminate the use of edge wells, but rather being able to consider the whole plate for your study. And here, now you have just to take a look at the reddish area. So now all the dosages here in red have been plotted below here. And then the same thing has happened from the red wells um, where you see the plot of the randomized plate as well. And if you compare now the two plots, unrandomized where the randomized, you can see that when doses are randomized, that systematic dips at high and low doses will disappear into the assay noise. So if you compare that area to the one over here. And at the same time, you can also see that in the unrandomized experiment, you have almost no data points here in the area where you would determine the IC50s. Whereas here, you would see that there would be already a starting point where you would get there. And in the next slide, you can see what is now the implication. So having the complete freedom of applying any dosage and any well, and also using different kind of formats, you could now go from the standard three times eight dosages, for example, to a, a 16 singlicates or 24 singlicate dosages. And the impact would be like you can see here in these plots, when you use three times eight, then you have the three doses of each dosage point, but that may end up in a situation where you may not have a lot of data points in the relevant area of the curve. Whereas with the 16 singlicates, you can see that there are already more dosage in the relevant area. And with 24, there's really a rich data set 
giving you lots of data which would improve the ICC determination and the final hill slope calculation. So basically, by switching from the traditional 3 times 8 to 16 single cates or 24 single cates, you could substantially improve the data. But further on, that also is potential for savings. Because if you take now a look here, 8 times triplicates, you would need a full 96 well plate to do that kind of experiment. If you would switch to 16 single cates, you have potential for saving compounds, reagents, and plate areas. Um, and thereby, actually, if you go to the next step with the 24 single cates, you would see that you need the same amount as if you would do three times eight dosages. So either you could go for the same amount of compounds, here three times eight, 24 times single cates, by getting the best data, or if you're looking for the best value for money, you could switch to the 16 single cates and save compounds and reagents. In, as a consequence, in the next step, you could think of what we call targeted dosing. So the ideal situation would always be where you end up in a situation where you have a rich data set in the relevant area of the curve. And so that means, coming back to what we said in the beginning, if you use the traditional setup with robotics or manually, you often do what is practical in terms of the dilution. And here, you would end up in the best IC50, EC50 determination. And what you can do with the plate wizard is that you can basically define different zones. So let's assume you have done already some pre-experiments, and you found out that your IC50 is in the area of 30 micromolar. And now, you could, for example, approach the situation by using 12-point dosages, um, up to 100 micromolar in a linear fashion, or again the 12 points, same range in a logarithmic fashion, or you could also go for a targeted dosing, also in a logarithmic fashion, where you, have, where you subdivide the areas into three segments. And that would be basically zone 1, 2, and 3. And that is what you can see here in the plate wizard. Here I have from basically um, 1 picomolar to 20 micromolar, that would be the first zone. And then you have the second one, which is the most relevant one, from 20 to roughly 40. And then the third one, which goes up to 100. Now the system allows you to apply here a linear or logarithmic titration type, but also, and that is most critical now, to define the number of dosage points or data points. And what you can see, or hopefully see here is, now we have two in the beginning, two in the end, and uh, eight data points that are actually in the relevant area. What you can do then as well is that you can um, get rid of the overlapping areas. And when you have done that, here you can see what is the outcome of that. So let's assume we have applied 12 dosages in, and in a linear mode or no, let's start with the logarithmic mode, that would be the reddish area. Now you can see that only one dose is in the relevant area of the IC50 determination, so between the 20 and the 40 micromolar. And if you go to the linear mode, that is the greenish area, then you can see that we finally end up only in two dosage points, and if we have applied the targeted one, then we basically end up in nine dosages which fall into the vicinity of the IC50. So with the same amount of data points, we have just greatly achieved to set them and control them in a manner that we have the most data points in the relevant area for the analysis. So without increasing the cost, we can incre increase dramatically the outcome of our IC50 determination. And as a next thing, you can see when you do this targeted dosing that you greatly improve the standard area. So here we compare the 8-point triplicate with 16-point singlet and 24-point singlet. And then you can see that the standard error 
actually declines from 8-point triplicate to 60-point singlet and to 24-point singlet. So that means, in other words, with the 24-point singlet assay, we would get the best result. But if you then compare the standard dosage versus the targeted dosing, you can see that the standard error is greatly diminished if we go from a standard dosing to a, type, to a targeted dosing scheme. And as you can imagine, the best result is what you would achieve then if you would use the 24-point dosage together with the targeted application. Now, if you put that to the very extreme, you could even think of what we call high-density titration. So in that case, we have been using a 384-point active site titration with up to 50 points per lock. And you can see if you do an experiment like that, you get an extremely high precision because already here from the red dashed line, you can see these are really monotonic data and thereby you get the best IC50 determination that you could think of, even making global fitting obsolete. And so why could this be an interesting experiment? I would think that whenever you consider experiments like active site determinations, in particular in areas of uh, enzymologic studies, like proteases and so on, you would require an inhibitor with potency equivalent to the enzyme. And here such an experiment has been done, and it was assumed from previous manual experiments that the active site concentration would be 33%, and with, by using the HPD 300, it was found out that it's actually 25%. So these kinds of experiments could greatly increase the understanding of your target biology and doing these kinds of enzymatic studies. And last but not least, I would also like to refer you to what we call drug-drug interaction studies. So basically, because you can apply any dose in any well, there is no hindrance why the system shouldn't allow you to also apply not only one drug, but several compounds to it. And here you can see where there was the compound A, which was applied actually across the plate, and another compound B also across the plate, and then an agonist down the plate. And if you do such experiments, that could be of particular interest when you do uh, work in therapeutic areas where a monotherapeutic approach would be limited and where you have unmet needs. That could be, for example, when you focus on research areas like oncology and cancer or where you also like to apply drug cocktails like in HIV or cardiovascular. Um, but that could also be used in areas like where you want to do um, study allosteric modulation uh, because then you also would like to get an understanding how a potential allosteric site may be modulated by a drug. And here you can see just the outcome of such experiment where you can see that in dependence of the compound A versus B, you have here almost a, a reverse effect of the agonist, whereas here you have only a subtle shift in the IC50 determination. So with that part, I would like to close my session, actually, uh, which gives you an exemplified idea of what you could potentially do with the experiment. And in the next part, I would like to hand over to Richard Marcellus, actually from the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, that would like to talk to you about the use of the HPD 300 in its daily practice at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. Thank you, Richard. Hello. Thanks for joining me in this presentation. So at the um, Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, we are a government-funded institute. Um, funded by the Ontario government. We have a broad range of interests going from clinical right down to uh, discovery of new targets. Um, I'm primarily involved in a medicinal chemistry drug discovery platform. Uh, there's a lot of medicinal chemists here, and I'm, as I as we've mentioned, I'm a biochemist. And we work closely with the genomics and bioinformatics group in target discovery 
uh, identification of, of targets from uh, deep sequencing studies. So um, in my role here, I do quite a few different things. Um, a lot of my work is in collaboration with academics in the, uh, the local universities. We also work with clinicians who have access to primary tumor samples uh, and then um, also looking at uh, drug resistance studies with clinicians. So one thing that really attracted us to the D300 was the ease of operation. Because we have a lot of collaborators and working with many different people, setting things up on, on robots is complicated. It's nice to have a system where I can provide tool compounds, kinase inhibitors, for example, to collaborators, show them how to use the software uh, over an hour, and after sort of a brief training, they can do it, the studies themselves. So that saves me from setting up things on a robot, preparing serial dilutions with the robot or by hand, uh, major time savings. It's also allowed us for much of our cell-based work to move to 384 well plates. We, before, we were only on 96 well plates. That saved us a lot of um, uh, tissue culture with uh, precious or hard to grow primary uh, tumor samples and stem cells. And one thing that's been a big issue for us is many of the drug compounds we work with are not very soluble in aqueous. And generally when we're doing cell-based assays, we would do our dilution series in DMSO and then step down to uh, uh, say a 5% DMSO solution in aqueous. Uh, at a 10% a 10x concentration and then go from there onto cells. And we're often seeing precipitation problems with some of the more uh, insoluble compounds. So the, the direct dispensing gets us away from that issue where you don't have an intermediate aqueous step. So beyond the simplicity of using it, the fact that we can get away with just providing very small samples to our collaborators is also a big uh, money savings for us. We can use about two microliters generally is what we need of a compound in, as a 10 millimolar stock to, uh, to load up the HP wells, whereas when we're doing serial dilutions by hand or on the robot, we're generally starting with 100 microliters and then doing a 50 plus 50 uh, series. Um, so now we just freeze down low volume daughter plates of our main sort of focused libraries and we can give those to our collaborators for use. When we're doing our uh, internal medicinal chemistry, Things that are hard to make, I often end up with quite small quantities of compound, half a mig, for example, and the HP does let us stretch that to many assays. It's, it's 100 microliters is plenty of, of compound uh, when you're dealing with uh, digital dispensing. The other thing that's been very useful is the experimental flexibility. Uh, as has been mentioned a few times, uh, being able to randomize gets rid of some of the uh, systemic edge effects. We still, um, we still get rid of some of the uh, edges, as I'll also point out later, the corners, for example, but we're using quite a bit of the edges for uh, many of our experiments. Uh, the, con the flexibility in setting up concentrations is nice when you're working with uh, uh, known drug compounds that have ranges that may differ substantially. Uh, for example, Taxol versus an anti-metabolite. It could be quite a different range you want to work in. And also, we're starting to get into doing more synergy and combination layouts, which is very difficult to do by hand, at least with our setup. But with the dispenser, it's very easy. And I'll give you some, I'll show you an example of, of some of the work we've done there. Okay, so one of the major projects that we started with when we first got the instrument was a, um, a drug screening um, campaign using a focused library. We have an uh, internal tool compound library of about 1,000 compounds. That includes all of the approved cancer drugs, plus a lot of um, uh, compounds that are in clinical trials or advanced preclinical. It covers all the kinase inhibitors and lots of things, epigenetic targets. So it's quite a good uh, library for finding uh, pathways that our uh, tumor cell lines have grown dependent upon. And we're using that library on something that's sort of close to a primary human tumor sample. So when the surgeon takes out the tumor, those uh, tumors are grown in mice as xenografts and then uh, flipped onto plastic. And the ones that grow, we do our studies on those. So we're the purpose of this study is to identify either advanced or approved compounds that show promise in treating that cancer type. We're also looking to figure out what pathways are um, 
that these tumor cells are dependent upon. We combine that kind of data with the genomic sequencing data, which kinases are expressed, uh, which, which uh, kinases are mutated, and then are the appropriate inhibitors of those kinases actually reading out with cytotoxicity. So we, use, we put all that data together to try and validate targets for further follow-up. And then we're also getting into uh, combination, combination analysis on these uh, sort of semi-primary tumors uh, using standard of care uh, or also just other pairings of, of inhibitors that are more hypothesis driven. So the, the standard way, sorry, the standard way that, um, sorry about that, I'm going the wrong direction, that we set up our, um, our, our viability assays is 24 compounds on a plate. Generally, this is a non-randomized layout, just so you can see what it looks like. So I'm, I'm sort of setting it up with the titrations going down each column. Um, usually a 72-hour viability assay is done. And we generally run 14 points, so I can fit 24 compounds on the plate, plus my uh, negative controls and positive controls for 100% uh, and 0% viability. This um, setup is then randomized. And um, the only thing I do uh, special is I exclude uh, three points in each corner, which I've found to be generally the worst points with our cell lines and our tissue culture setup. And then the rest of the edges I'm using for these experiments. Uh, before, when I wasn't excluding those 12 corner points, this is the sort of data I would see where there'd be, uh, this is not a particularly toxic compound, so the, the low wells show up very clearly. So generally, we'd see the corners, we'd see a repeating pattern uh, where the corners are low. Uh, so even though I randomize everything, we do use the same randomized pattern for each sort of set of 24 compounds and on each cell line. We don't do a fresh randomization pattern. Uh, that would be a little bit, uh, uh, would add to the workload when it comes to deconvoluting all that data. Generally now, I hand tweak the randomization pattern as well just to make uh, an equal number of edges on each compound. When you do a randomization, obviously it's random, so sometimes you end up with four edges on one compound and no edges on another. So we just sort of uh, edit the um, file that the HP dispenser is using to deliver the compounds. It's a file that's uh, editable in Excel, so it's quite easy to, to move things around. The other thing we did early on was figure out if we needed to do D DMSO normalization. With a standard um, dose response curve or serial dilution, of course, you have equal amounts of DMSO in each well um, if you do your dilutions in DMSO. But when you're doing it on the HP, you're only delivering as much DMSO into the well as your, your um, compound delivery required. So it's only at the very top dose of compound that you're hitting your top dose of DMSO, which for us is generally 0.5%. And at the beginning, we were backfilling all of the wells to put 0.5% uh, in all the wells. And then we, we just did the test to see if it was making any difference. Because so backfilling your 384 wells takes a bit of time. And it also uses up more wells than your cassette, uh, slightly increasing the cost. So when we checked backfill to 0.5%, uh, we compared it to backfilling to 0.125%, leaving the top two concentrations of drug with a slightly higher DMSO. And then we just, in the green dots, there's no backfilling at all. And we found with an assortment of compounds on a bunch of different cell lines that it really was not showing any benefit to backfill with DMSO. Our IC50 values were the same. If anything, we were seeing more noise with the 0.5% uh, backfilled in red. Um, our cells are a little bit unhappy when you get up to 0.5%, so I think it's for us it's better to just not backfill at all. It's only the very top concentration that's going to hit that. Uh, and if compound's toxic, it doesn't really matter because the, the cells are dead anyway. And when the compounds are not toxic, we're still not really seeing that much effect on our viability. So, so that, that one would have 0.5%, 0.25, 0.125%. We're not seeing any... Uh, we're not seeing any um, uh, disruption of our data that's causing our curve fitting to give us different values. Or, um, so we now do not DMSO normalize on uh, any of these studies. This is some examples of some curves. Uh, this, this data was generated on some uh, 
uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma cells. And this is a uh, GEMSAR, which is a standard of care. Um, it doesn't actually work all that well on most of our tumor lines. The DP lines are, uh, are xenograft-derived uh, primary tumors. The uh, HPDEs is a control line. It's more normal. It's the only line that really gets killed well by uh, GEMSAR. Scanning through our tool compound library, we did find some interesting things. This was just sort of a first pass through it, just to see how this procedure was going to work. And we've uncovered some uh, interesting inhibitors where we're seeing a nice spread in potency. We're not generally looking for things that kill all the cell lines equivalently, because pancreatic cancer is quite a heterogeneous cancer, and we don't really expect to find a single um, specific focus. Uh, inhibitor that's going to kill them all with an equal IC50, that would uh, suggest to us it's probably non-specific, or not, it's just not going to show a therapeutic window. It's going to kill all cells. So we're looking for things that are showing some spread in activity. This data is then given to our genomics group to see if it makes sense. Like for example, if we're using uh, a MEK inhibitor, uh, do these cell lines actually uh, overexpress that pathway or have mutations in that pathway? So we're, we're looking for spreads generally. That's more informative for our genomics people, and it's also, I think, more interesting from uh, an eventual clinical perspective in identifying uh, uh, pathways that may be driving certain subsets of, the, uh, of these tumors. Here's just another example of uh, one. Often it was the, it's the normal cell line that's the most sensitive to inhibitors, so whenever we see uh, one of the actual tumor lines showing the greatest sensitivity, those ones are, are interesting to uh, follow up with the genetics. And again, that's, these are all pretty good spreads. So generally, these, this is the, the best data we were getting. Most compounds in our library were either not toxic um, or the lines were much tighter together, showing no real difference between the lines. Okay, so that, that's our, our, our basic single compound work. We've also started doing some synergy experiments or just combination analysis. Uh, again, this, this work is done on uh, those pancreatic lines. And here we're using uh, inhibitors against two different targets in sort of different branches of the same major KRAS pathway. And we've got our inhibitor one in brown going across the plate in two batches of 10 by 10. And then we've got our inhibitor number two coming down the plate, and then we've got another inhibitor in yellow against the same target as the blue inhibitor going down the plate, and then we've got our controls in the bottom. So that's the, the way I would lay the, um, the experiment out initially in the HP software, and then we switch over to uh, scrambling it and uh, get our randomization. For this kind of study, I, I've skipped all the edges. Um, there's the scrambled pattern. When you scramble something, of course, you have to be able to descramble it. Um, you don't want to do that manually, on a, certainly not in a 384 well plate. So what we do here is we paste in our plate reader data from our, um, our Envision. It's, um, we're usually doing ATP uh, determinations. That data gets put in a single column. So we just use um, an offset function to put our data down in a column. Then from the HP software, when it delivers the compounds to the cell, it gives you a, uh, to the cells, it gives you a report of what is put in each well. And if you take that report file and sort it, you can get the concentrations all lined up in a row. And right beside it, it's telling you the corresponding well where that concentration, those two combinations were delivered. So in, in row, in sort of in well uh, N5 on my plate, that's where I put uh, one micromolar of one compound and 4.99 of the other. So then I'm using a lookup function. Um, when I'm building my uh, result table, I'll, I'll just reference over to this uh, N5, and then the lookup function will scan down this list, find N5, go across to the second column, and grab the number, and then pull it back for me. So it, it, it sounds complicated, but it, once, once you've got a template set up, you just paste your data in, and it's all processed automatically. That's the way we've set it up. So here's just an example of um, uh, that, that synergy analysis I showed you. So here we've got uh, one compound uh, going down the well, right down that column. It, we're getting a maximum of 32% uh, um, viability remaining, so 70% kill. 
There's the, there's the other compound hitting the same target. We're getting a 43% kill. Our other one was hitting a 44% kill. So what we were doing here is taking uh, a couple of compounds that really were not killing down to zero. We were getting at best uh, 30 to 40% residual cells surviving after our uh, three-day assay. So we we're doing the combination to see how that would, what would happen and just get, our, our, uh, just get used to doing synergy analysis. So here's the raw data. Um, it normalized to 100 with our controls. You can see the data is a little bit noisy, and for synergy analysis, we thought it would be better to smooth that data out. So what we've done here is just curve fit um, each column, and then uh, read back in uh, curve fitted values just to give us a smoothing function. Get rid of the noise that may show up as, as a synergy or antagonism. So there is the there's the smooth data. We've now taken our smooth data and we're um, using that to do bliss analysis. Um, it's it's one method of looking for synergy. There's there's many methods of doing it. Um, it's a fairly simple simple approach. So to do that, you you convert your data to a fractional response. Um, so instead of being a hundred down to one, it is instead point uh, one being. 0.0 being no killing, uh, 0.999 being a, a full kill. That, uh, those fractional responses are used to do a bliss prediction. Um, that's it's a very simple formula to do the bliss prediction. So that's the uh, uh, estimating how much killing you should be getting by combining a certain dose of one compound with another dose of the other, figuring out what you should get. And then you can do a calculation on um, how your actual data is deviating from your prediction. Um, so we've just here I've just done a heat map of excess cell kill above the bliss prediction. So in red you're seeing we're getting more killing there than we expected to get, or at least the bliss predicted us to get. Uh, some slight green is showing a bit of an, uh, I don't even know if that's antagonism, I think plus or minus 10 in this kind of assay is, uh, is probably uh, noise. Here's just a 3D plot. The stuff going above the line is excess cell kill beyond the prediction. And if you just break that data out and take uh, compound in blue with uh, our, our uh, first inhibitor, and we can combine it with that dose of uh, second compound. So the blue compound plus that dose of 7453, the predicted line is the dotted red, the circles, and then the actual uh, result is the solid line. So that this this space in here is our our excess uh, kill over bliss, which which may or may not be a synergy or some kind of some kind of effect beyond the uh, simple additive. So o overall, we've we've been using this machine now. Oh, it must be at least five months. We're very pleased with with how simple it is to operate. How quickly I've been able to train many different people to use it. It's saving me a lot of labor, not having to prepare dilution plates for people. So it, in that sense, it saves us labor costs. And being able to set up uh, experiments with more flexibility is, is really influenced the kind of work we're doing. We're now running a much larger uh, dilution series or titration series. It's not 8 point anymore or 10 point. We're really going up to usually in the range of 16 points. Um, that, that's been nice to get a bit more density, uh, three to four points per log in our uh, viability assays. And the data quality has been very good. We're very pleased. We've done some uh, comparisons of my hand pipetting uh, as carefully as I can do it with how well the dispenser does it. We've analyzed that by um, LCMS. And with soluble compounds, the HP uh, is certainly as good as I am. And with compounds that are uh, not so soluble in aqueous, when we did the test where we went through an intermediate aqueous dilution, the, um, my data was much more scattered than we're getting from the HP, which obviously does not have that uh, limitation. So we've been very pleased um, with, with that. OK, so that's it for me. Thank you very much for that, Richard. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are now um, going to move into our first and only poll of, to of today's session. So in a minute, uh, your screens will turn blue with uh, the following question. 
So I, I think that my laboratory could benefit from the following techniques or dose resp response curve formats. So uh, there are some um, an um, question answers there that uh, you guys can select, and you can select more than one answer. Randomization, targeted dosing, finely spaced dosing, uh, high density titration, and drug to drug interaction. So we'll give you guys um, around uh, 30 more seconds to uh, cast your votes. And um, Jessica, do you have any um, thoughts or uh, any, any comments you'd like to make about this polling question? Sure. Uh, we were asking this because every laboratory has a different workflow, different priorities and interest in their small molecule work. So we were wondering if we could learn more about what the webinar participants uh, feel that they could benefit from in their lab. Uh, for example, targeted dosing is most interesting when research, excuse me, when researchers already have some previous knowledge of their compound IC50 value, while um, it's become more and more um, interesting to look at uh, in vitro drug-drug interaction studies by a, a number of different labs, just like Richard was talking about. And finally, um, finally, space dosing and randomization can both improve data quality and also uh, decrease overall running costs. So it will be interesting to see um, how the participants uh, vote. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Jessica. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, now, um, unfortunately, we've uh, I'm about to close the poll, so you can, will no longer be able to vote. And um, I'm actually going to um, carry on with the presentation. So Jessica, it's now over to you. So uh, the next part, we just wanted to give a quick summary of what we had talked about today. Um, we see several benefits being brought to a variety of laboratories with the HPD 300. Um, we talked about randomization and how that can lead to decreased edge effects. Um, targeted dosing, uh, which could give you less standard error in IC50 values, um, high resolution titrations, um, accurate drug-drug titrations are now really possible. Um, there's an extended working range between 10 microliters down to 13 picoliters, which really uh, differentiates the system from other um, uh, dispensers out there. Um, direct, this, it's, it's creating a direct titration, so it's tipless, there's no dilution at all. We talked about time savings, the fact that you can dispense any dose in any well. And finally, there we go, um, some improved accuracy versus manual or automated. There is an optional shaking uh, for the destination plate during the dispense. Um, you can dispense into multiple plates from each dispense head, uh, better hill slopes, um, some of the cost savings. Uh, from not using tips or plates, potentially fewer uh, bioassay wells. And finally, the convenient software that can be used uh, along with the system. All of these together create more scientifically relevant data more efficiently. So that's the end of our part here. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much for that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are now um, entering in our question and answer session. Um, I would just like to uh, thank the guys for their, what was a great presentation and um, to remind you that you can submit questions using the questions toward the top right hand of your screen. So please do so uh, as and when you think of them and uh, Jessica will um, get back to you um, uh, uh, if we have enough time. Now I would just like to note that the, 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 the two speakers, Richard and Ingo, uh, unfortunately are no longer with us in this presentation so please do direct your questions towards Jessica, and if we have en enough time, we will get through as many as possible. Uh, so Jessica, I'm just going to go jump in uh, straight here. Uh, someone's asked a question, uh, what was your previous method for setting up dose response curves? So for, for Richard um, at OICR, his previous method was both a, a mixture of um, manual uh, serial dilution and also using some automation. But all of that was done um, in 96 well plates and always using an eight-point triplicate. And they've been able now to transition to 3D4 well plates and also um, to doing six-point singles instead of eight-point triplicate, so saving on wells as, uh, in the bioassay screen. Excellent. Thank you very much for that one there. Um, another question has come through. Uh, why do you make a customized randomization pattern? 
So again, for Richard at OICR, um, he is making a customized randomized pattern really just to make it easier to handle, handle uh, the, the data calculations uh, following the runs. Um, this is something actually in the newest software that will be released soon that will be um, handled a little bit easier. Uh, customers will have the option to create a randomization pattern within the software and then apply that to um, any plate in the future. In the version that Richard was using, he was actually um, creating that himself manually in Excel. Um, so it'll be, it, it should be much more streamlined in the new version. Excellent. Thank you very much for that question there. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a, a, a bit of time on our hands, so if you do um, want to submit a question, um, then please do so. And if you um, do not think of a question uh, right now, then uh, please take note of the speaker's details on the screen, and uh, feel free to email them at any point um, after the presentation, and I'm sure they will be more than happy to get back to you at a later date. Okay, so um, another question has come through. Um, do you have any concerns about dispensing high concentration of DMSO directly to the cell? Um, from speaking with Richard before, he's actually not concerned about that, and, and most of our users are not, because when the system is dispensing the compounds in DMSO directly to that assay plate, um, you can actually enable a shaking function so that as the compound is being dispensed, it, it's not landing in um, in the, the very center of the well and you know causing cell death in that area. Instead, it's immediately mixed into the cell media and then dispersed throughout the well. Um, so, users that are uh, running cell-based assay have had, have had very good results um, by using that shaking function. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. There, Jessica. Um, another question has come in is, um, for low uh, solubility compounds, uh, how does the system not get clogged? Sure. So the way that the dispense heads are manufactured, there's actually some small um, uh, uh, filtering structures within the dispense head so that um, there are multiple fluid paths leading to each of the nozzles. and um, those filtering structures can hold back any particulates um, that might be in your uh, compound, and then, the, but the rest of the fluid is allowed to pass through down to that nozzle in order to dispense. So I think that that's part of why, as Richard had said before, he did a comparison of his own uh, manual pipetting versus using the Hewlett Packard instrument with these low, soluble, low, low solubility compounds, and found that the Hewlett Packard was able to give better data in the end. Um, or more consistent data, I should say, um, and I think that that is a big part of the reason why. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, there's been a few questions come in about um, wondering about the slides and the availability of them afterwards. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and um, answer those for everyone. The presentation slides will be made available after the webinar, so please listen up for further instructions, uh, and um, you will be able to download and view the webinar at a later date on demand as well. So just for those people who have been asking questions about the presentation slides and stuff, they will be made available. So uh, we've had another question come in. Um, unfortunately, this person uh, missed the first half of the seminar, um, and, and they wanted to know, um, did you uh, say how much volume the wells take and how many IC5Os can you make from one well? Yep, so for each dispense head, um, the user can load up to 10 microliters of compound, and then you can dispense that compound into uh, a number of destination plates as desired. Um, at the low end, the system can dispense 13 picoliters, um, and in the current software version um, that Richard was showing on here, you would be able to dispense into up to five different destination plates. Um, in, the, in the new software that we'll have coming out in the next couple of weeks, there, the limitation on the number of plates, that you, destination plates that you can dispense to is eliminated. Um, so you could make um, however many uh, IC50 curves that you can from a total of 10 microliter, that's the fill volume into each dispense head. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, we've had another question come in. Um, do you need to wash between different samples, or do you need to change the loader each time? 
Great question. So each dispense head is actually uh, created to be single use. Um, because we have such small volumes that we need to accurately dispense through the dispense head, um, the decision was made that once you've used that dispense head to dispense into a number of different plates, um, that dispense head will be marked um, elect electrically as, be as been used. Then the next time you come to use the system, the user will be able to move on to the next dispense head um, and load compound and continue on. Um, and it, HP and TCAN really believe that this gives the most um, consistent and reliable dispensing, um, especially when you're talking about the possibility for these, you know, really small micro microstructures that would need to be cleaned out. It's just not possible. Excellent. Thank you very much for that there, Jessica. Well, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we have run out of time. Um, Jessica, would you care to give us some um, final concluding Oh, we've had one more question actually just come in at last second. Uh, I don't know if you want to po possibly answer that one. Um, sure. Maybe take, okay. Uh, how long sure. does it t take to dispense into a 384 well plate, uh, say 24 to 16 point curves? Um, it, it really depends on the actual uh, user, but I would give an estimation that it would take round about 10 minutes or so to load your compounds and dispense them all into the 3D4 well plate. Um, TCAN uh, has been very happy to um, run on-site demos with customers. Um, so that's certainly something that if there is an interest um, that the TCAN uh, sales reps can set up together so that you would be able to see that um, with your own eyes. Excellent. Thank you very much for that last minute question there. So yeah, um, again, if you'd like to uh, maybe give some concluding comments and then we can start to wrap things up. Sure, that sounds great. Thanks again to everyone for joining our webinar today. Um, I hope that it's been useful to learn about how both the HPD300 and the experimental types that it enables for researchers of small molecules and DMSO. We truly believe that for low to medium throughput labs that this instrument can be a real game changer because of time savings, compound savings, and the experimental setup types that are enabled by direct digital titration. You can visit our website for additional details on the instrument, including some poster presentations made at recent drug discovery conferences. The address is down there at the bottom where it says www.tcan.com slash digital titration. Um, thanks again for your time and attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation, Jessica. So uh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately we have run out of time. Uh, if you would like to contra contact uh, Richard, Jessica, or Ingo at a later date, then please take note of the contact details on your screen now, and I'm sure they'll be more than happy to uh, get into contact with you um, at another point in, 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 in time. So I'd just like to thank Ingo, Richard, and Jessica for what was a great presentation, and to thank Tekan for sponsoring this session. The presentation slides and the webinar recording will be made available at our website, uh, which is business-review-webinars.com with an S at the end, uh, as I stated earlier. And um, we look forward to sharing further webinars with you, so please do keep an eye out on the website just mentioned, and follow us on Twitter, at BRWebinars, for daily updates. And also, join in our LinkedIn group, Business Review Webinars. Once again, I'd just like to thank uh, the speakers for joining today, and thank you for uh, attending the session, and I hope you all have a nice day.